mark the Cuban chair to eliminate stupid patents for one more day. One more day. Um, as of tomorrow, I guess officially, I'm uh, leaving to join Engine to join Mike at Engine. Uh, I'm going to be his boss. Yay! <laughs> so why don't you guys? Why don't we go around and say? And I'm, I should also say that I'm obviously interested in the patent space. I mean, that's what I. That's not only my job, but I was a litigator in private practice before. I'm a patent lawyer. Um, I think like a lot of patent lawyers, like a lot of, when I was a young lawyer and I finished law school and was very idealistic about the system still, I got into private practice and I was like, oh my God, this sucks. <laughs> this isn't what it's supposed to be. And that's why, largely why I do what I do now. So um, that's kind of where, where I uh, come at this from. So why don't we go around, everyone can introduce yourselves. Um, if you want to you know, also say a little bit like why you're interested. You guys who, <laughs> We're putting you up for this. You can be more <laughs> circumspect if you want. <laughs> but we're, I would love to hear. Um, so why don't Robin? You wanna... Sure. I'm Professor Robin Feldman. I'm at the University of California, Hastings, and I direct the Institute for Innovation Law. We do a lot of empirical and theoretical research on patents these days, particularly patent trolls. We run a program called the Startup Legal Garage, where our students do free legal work for startup companies with their work supervised pro bono by outside companies. I'm Brad Burnham. I work for a venture capital firm in New York. Uh, we have about 55 portfolio companies. About 25 of those are being sued, uh, all over a business or so, uh, business method or software patent, all by trolls. None by you know, actual competitors, and in no case were any of the companies aware of the existence of the patent that they are being sued for. So that constitutes a problem in our lives. Uh, we spend a lot of time and energy. Uh, trying to uh, fight that off. Um, we're very concerned that, that it's a completely asymmetrical war in the sense that it costs almost nothing to launch a suit and it costs a great deal to defend one. Um, and it makes it very convenient for, um, for software trolls to target uh, startups who can't afford to uh, put up the defense. So we see a pattern where they very often will test the waters by going after a startup who will settle for $25,000, $250,000, um, and then they use that money to work up the chain um, to just uh, ever-increasing stakes. And the, the bummer is that we end up being the front line. Uh, and the real bummer for American innovation you know, or global innovation is that, that uh, it's the best and most brightest young companies that are taking the chain. May I add something about strategy? So once they've gotten licenses out of the smaller folks, then they sue the bigger folks and they go to court and they say the licenses are evidence that we have a rational basis for our um, for asserting our patent in this case. It's a great, it's a great argument. Paul Siminski, I'm the general counsel of Automatic. We do um, operate WordPress.com, which is what we're best known for. We also are very heavily involved in the WordPress open source software project a lot of services and business around that. Um, I'm a lawyer, but not a patent lawyer. Um, I was at Gunderson for a while, which is a law firm in Silicon Valley, for a while before that, doing corporate and startup M&A work mostly. So I kind of came at this problem by just sort of being on the receiving end of, of exactly what you're talking about, these sort of inbound patent troll suits, of which we've had a few, just like every other company. Um, we're lucky in that you know we've sort of grown to a size where we can sort of start to mount a little bit more of a defense to these. But when I've been in you know groups of defendants along with other companies that are much much smaller than us, and you see that firsthand where it really is a threat to you know their existence. Whereas to us, you know, we can fight a little bit more. Um, and I think you know just kind of seeing the strategy of the trolls firsthand is exactly what you're saying. I mean, they're using the weapons of the patent system and the litigation <coughs> system to just extort settlements based on a patent that has no value. And I mean, to me, it's, it, it, the, the interesting perspective I have is, is dealing with the trolls firsthand, but then also just internally, just kind of the dynamics of the company, just seeing how it, in, how it impacts us kind of day to day and like those conversations where you have to go into your CEO, your management team, the people that actually, you know, built this product that 21% of the internet uses and say, hey, Somebody claims they invented this. They're like, what? <laughs> you know, I mean, that, just the whole dialogue now of sort of this, the, the, the pro patent troll lobby that's like, protect the innovator. I'm like, well, we're the innovator. It's like, protect us from, you know, protect us. So that just seeing kind of how all those pieces play out just in real life has been really kind of 
kind of fascinating and troubling, and that's sort of why I've been, you know, involved in trying to, to, to solve this problem. Hello, Michael Norwood, and uh, I'm actually started my career as a writer, uh, writing Hollywood scripts, television and movie scripts, and books and things like that. And I was always represented by an agent, and originally in television, and then later on for books. And um, through some odd quirk of fate, I got into the technology field because um, my book series was popularized online through a, a popular newsletter. And um, I was looking for a better way to, to elicit comments from my readers. And so I hired some programmers to work with me for several years on developing an online software program. But before I started working with them, um, I filed for a patent. Because in Hollywood, when I was a kid and I first went out there, I was 19 years old, uh, I would find that I'd get interviewed for hours by the, the different television studios, and I would never get paid for it, but the next year I'd see my ideas on television. Hmm. So when I started in the tech industry, I looked at patents as just an important part of me just protecting what, what I'm doing. So I kind of come from this, sort of from both sides of the fence. I mean, as a, as a small startup company, um, uh, understanding that we have to be very careful about whatever type of technology that we're using. But I also come at it from the other standpoint because uh, I have some valuable patents that I filed over the years, and it's like I've got to be afraid to raise my head above the line simply because you got, you know, uh, it, there's got to be such a war there that, uh, you know, it's like everything is so polarized. And what I'm interested in is what is that median solution that both protects the inventors because the abuses are on both sides of the fence but at the same time protects uh, the small company, startup company, as we're all talking about, from uh, frivolous suits that, that occur. Um, I'm Ethan Guillen. I work <coughs> primarily on access to medicines uh, through a patent lens um, and do some trade work. Um, I do work with the Medicines Patent Pool, which is the first patent pool in the medicine sector based on the, on the tech sector model. Um, and uh, I'm here basically because I like, there's a lot of overlapping issues in trade, and so I'm interested to hear more about thinking on patents from the tech side. I'm actually really glad you're here, too, because I think we could also be well-served, well, very knowledgeable about this area, but we could be well-served by hearing sure. um, some of the access to meds. Nope. Access to meds issues, too. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it informs the conversation, and it's largely been um, excluded from the popular current debate on that. So we're going to be on the spot, so we don't mind. <laughs> My name is Jeremy Blula. I'm a new staff technologist at EFF. Uh, and I'm Yay. mostly here to... Uh, my background is actually I was a, uh, did my PhD in robotics. And so I definitely come more from the tech side of things. And I'm mostly just here to, to learn. I got to follow the robot guy? <laughs> yep, sorry. Uh, I'm Michael McGarry. I'm the co-founder and... Um, Chief Political Strategist for Engine, uh, which, again, I'm very happy to have brought on uh, my new boss here uh, so that I can continue to learn and, and the organization can grow. Uh, but when we're talking about patents here today, the reason that our organization got involved in a little bit of background, Engine is devoted to building better public policy alternatives from and for the startup community all around the United States. The patent uh, trolls and, and, and reform of, of that kind of behavior is something that's causing uh, a lot of sort of heartburn, in, in a sense, for, for that community. Brad talked about their portfolio companies. If you expand that out to the entire community throughout the country, it really does have a large-scale chilling effect in a, in a macroeconomic sense on what we can do in terms of opportunity and growth in this country. So it's something that we needed to take on um, uh, head on. Um, we spent the better part of the last couple of years uh, working on first, what are the solutions uh, coming from this community that we could amplify and then trying to get congressional and regulatory partners on that. Now we're in a situation where uh, this is a, a hot political issue, um, uh, which is incredible to say in a, in a patent sense. But um, So we're doing a lot of work, whether uh, with Paul, who I've uh, gone with to Washington on a number of occasions to talk to members of Congress, and Brad was just there last week. Um, of course, Julie and the FF and, and a lot of our other sort of activist partners that are working on this, uh, trying to get the ball now across the goal line. We, we had um, the House of Representatives pass a bill late last year. We're looking for the Senate to do the same probably in the next month, month and a half, and hopefully we'll have something for the President to sign that will 
um, not be a silver bullet, and I think we'll go into a little bit more of this, but we'll help sort of at least ratchet back some of the behavior that we've seen from this community by attacking it um, in, a, in a very sort of open and, uh, and, and sort of forward way. Um, the, the, the problems that we're facing in terms of getting that done are from the small inventor community, which I love talking about that because I always sort of, you know, see like the set of The Wizard of Oz with all these people running around inventing widgets, I don't know why, but there's, um, th there is this community which is largely held up by patent trolls themselves and universities working with them to try to um, stop the advancement of these um, of these fixes, whether it's the litigation reform pieces, whether it's openness in, in demand letters and, and throwing a little sunshine on that. Um, and so that has been the sort of one sticking point we've seen, but there's been broad consensus in Washington, as well as some state jurisdictions which have taken action, which we think has been really important and interesting to try to stop this at, a, at even a lower level. Um, but we, we are starting to see some of these sticking points, and it's important to see how we can continue to help that debate evolve and, and uh, ultimately get something out from this Congress that we can start working then on what the longer-term long solutions are. And you, we, we turn this into a little more of a conversation, so if you don't mind, introduce uh, No, my name is Ari Lesbier. I work for a firm called Archline, based in New York. It's a consulting vehicle. I'm currently working with a company that, that does network security and data protection in Latin America, and we're exploring issues related to innovation and what happens to innovation in this world of patent trolls. Uh, I mean, it's a very small piece of a larger pie, but I'm curious to, to learn from you all. Uh, Great. So I'm going to, we did have, you know, some things that people were going to talk about initially. Maybe we should still do that for a little bit. Maybe we can probably tighten up. Small. Sure. But I, I just want to say one quick thing before we started. Um, if people can think, one of the things that I've been trying to think a lot about lately, personally, is I think there's a very dangerous culture in our technology community, this desire to get as many patents as possible. And that's a much harder problem than the litigation problem. That's a much harder problem than the legislation problem, I should say. And so if while we're having this conversation, people kind of you know, keep that in the back of their mind and help thinking about that, I think we can do a great good for the world if we could kind of shift that culture a bit. Uh, so anyway, I'm just going to throw that out there and we're going to start with Robin. She's going to talk a little bit about patent systems and basics. So, as a professor in the group, I'll take my I'll take my <laughs> six minutes just to just to go over a little bit of the data of what's going on um, on the ground out there. And let me offer the the two segment version of what Brad was talking about before, which is it starts with the fact that it's very difficult to tell what a patent covers. We'll talk about that if we if people want to. And it costs between six hundred thousand dollars to six million dollars. For, to go to court to find out what a single patent um, covers. Mm -hmm. So if you are a computer company and I knock on your door and I say, I have a patent on gummy bear and you're infringing my patent. You say to me, infringing how? And I say, I actually don't have to tell you that. Um, and by the way, if you um, don't like this one, I have 100 more in my pocket and we can keep playing this all day, so why don't you just take a license for a small amount and everything will be fine. That is the basic business model. There are a variety of um, approaches now that, that are different from that, but that's the core of the business model. Um, it gets called NPE, non-practicing entities. It gets called PAE, patent assertion entities. It gets called troll and other things that are more colorful. Um, I tend to call them either NPEs or monetizers, and, and by that I mean those whose core activity is licensing or litigating patents as opposed to making products. Um, and looking at the data, uh, groups that are, uh, please join us. We, we, we decided we were small enough that we would have a round table conversation or a round floor conversation, whatever that is. So the, this particular business model, and I will tell you, I am, I am very careful about using the term entity because there is so much money at stake. There's a huge amount of jockeying over what the definition is. One of the attempts to play with the definition is to seize on the word entity and say, we leave out those who are organized as trusts or individuals. I mean, if you look at the business model, that, that leads to some kind of silly results, but, but you know, there's a lot of playing with the, with the terms and what they mean. So the, those whose business model is licensing or litigating patents have had a dramatic impact on patent litigation. 
They filed about 25% of the lawsuits in 2007. They were up to almost 60% of the patent lawsuits in 2012. That, that's a huge rise. Um, and that is really, that really represents the tip of the iceberg. If you look at the data in the White House report on patent assertion from last summer, 90% of the patent demands never get to a lawsuit. So most of the stuff is happening um, uh, do under you, the mirror. Do you have Please. the breakdown of um, the nature of the patents that are being asserted? Um, I've heard a number that says something like 80% of the troll suits are um, asserting a business method or a software patent. So this particular study that I was talking about that we did is four years and looked at 13,000 patent losses. We did not break it down by the category. There's another one I'm going to get to shortly, but I'll jump to that now, which was a study of the patents uh, asserted against startup companies. Mm -hmm. We were doing that by survey, so it's what people report. It's not as good as reading litigation, but that's all you can do because of non-disclosure agreements. So in that, um, we saw the largest group is indeed from information technology. That's software and business method patents. But 30% of the VCs we talked to said they had life science companies that had um, uh, patent demands against them. And we're seeing them in moving. I, from the, the best data that I can see, it started in information technology, which translates into software and business method. It's moving more into Main Street, and then now the next frontier appears to be life sciences, and there, um, there's a variety of evidence that the large aggregators are um, beginning to amass uh, life science patents. And, and when you say that, you mean patents that are focused on the, the life science aspect of the business, not this. When you talk about Main Street, of course, the reason they became a target is because they oftentimes use software that's generally available. I think that's right. So, but it's not only, I mean, you have it's all kinds of, you know, Xerox machines, scanners, all of those things, whatever you have that's technology. But life sciences, we're talking about um, patents that are related to uh, things like um, uh, basic cloning technologies. We're talking about not just peripheral patents, but also patents about core molecule technology. So, so it's it's um, it will be interesting if you think of it in those ways to see how how this plays out in the life science fields. It is not. I think there will be space for what you've talked about, which is to say, take business method patents and go after life science companies. But it, but what's happening is is appears to be deeper than that. It's a different. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, who's getting sued and where the money's going and where it's coming from. The majority of NPE lawsuits are filed against small businesses. And I'm not talking about the recent rise of sort of the attacks on mom and pop stores. This data goes back much farther than that. The majority of these lawsuits are filed against small businesses with revenues under $10 million, which is consistent with your experience of uh, who you target. The precise figures are difficult to come by, but Professors Beston and Moyer estimate that patent demands, we're talking not just the lawsuits, but all demands, are uh, cost U.S. Company tw companies $29 billion in 2011. And the next statistic is what I think of as really important. It's what economists are calling the leaky bucket, and that is that very little of that money flows back to inventors or to innovation. So it's only an estimated 20% of the money that goes to NPEs in any form flows back to the original inventor who made the patent and sold to the NPE or gets put into internal R&D by the non-practicing entity itself. So if you're someone who cares about innovation, this is a very troubling figure. And is that because they've made agreements to take pennies on the dollar or simply? Yes. Yes. I think that's it. It's also, though, you know, some of the structures of non-practicing entities are extraordinarily complicated. There are many of these that are structured um, by very sophisticated lawyers, but also lawyers who are sophisticated in, uh, in you know, the venture world and how um, funds are organized. And so their structure is such that very little of it goes to the inventor from whom they purchased it. Um, and, uh, and I have heard the, the head of the largest um, uh, aggregators say, we're not that good at making products. That's not what we do. Um, so, you know, we've done a little bit of R&D here and there. We spun off some companies. That's not really what we do, so that's not what we do. Um, and, and I think the best that we can figure out is that's accurate. The problem in studying this area is that um, 
most of the interactions are covered by very strict non-disclosure <coughs> agreements. Um, so you have legal silence. And then you also have a general sense of terror. Um, when people don't want anyone to know that, that they are a potential um, client of an NPD. Um, and so there's a, a high degree of fear and sensitivity. It makes it very hard to get accurate data um, in here. Uh, let me just skip ahead. So one of the things that we have tried to do is what I call data-driven lawmaking, and that is to test and challenge some of the narratives that are out there. You all have been talking about some of them. So there was one narrative that's been circulating in Washington that the NPE model is good for innovation because venture capitalists might be able to monetize patents if a startup company fails. They might be able to sell to um, non-practicing entities, and that possibility is attracting venture capital into the startup community. So um, I did a study of VCs and their portfolio companies, and I looked at a variety of things I'll talk about, but on that question itself, the venture capital community itself strongly disagreed. So I asked the VCs, when you're making funding decisions, do you consider the potential for selling patents to patent assertion entities if the company fails? And the overwhelming majority said, they don't. They don't consider it. It doesn't matter to them. It's not attracting capital. Um, <coughs> And in general, both the VCs and the startup companies said that they don't see this activity as positive for the startup community. 70% um, of the venture capitalists who responded have startup companies that have received patent demands. And then if you look at the portfolio companies, one in three portfolio companies has received patent demands. Um, and the, this study, and then there are other patent startup studies by Professor Colleen Chen, they show that the costs um, can run into the millions of dollars, although it's much cheaper if you choose to capitulate early. You can, you can get out at a much smaller amount. What I consider more important, and I'll, I'll turn to that for the last couple of minutes here, is what I call the human toll, especially in small companies and startup companies. Um, and there, there are some amazing quotes. This is from Professor Chen's startup study. Um, it was agonizing to hand over all the money we had earned from a product we had invented and created ourselves to a firm that invents nothing and creates nothing. Our founder has since lost his house, car, and all his assets. There were a lot of comments like this. Um, in the same vein, one company uh, said the following, we spent millions uh, pretty much to settle pretty much spurious claims. The common approach that these entities took is make a claim try to defend it as best they could, eventually offer to settle by observing that it would cost us three to five million dollars to fight and we might lose, versus the two million dollars, two to three million dollars they offered to settle. Uh, we'd work to negotiate them down to one to two million, we'd hold our nose and we would pay. So in, in addition to the human toll, it doesn't take fancy economics to understand the implications for innovation, and to paraphrase one VC, when companies are spending time and money responding to patent demands, they're not inventing and they're not hiring. Um, so I want to close with one additional thought that addresses some of the issues that, that you raise, and that is that um, the patent system, I believe, is tremendously important for, for innovation and for giving uh, startup companies a platform to build from. And rights are not useful if you can't enforce them. Um, along the same lines, monetization in theory could serve very positive economic ends. It could provide market mechanisms so people who have inventions could connect with those who could transfer those inventions and create products out of them. The way it's playing out at the moment, however, is um, troubling and nothing like that. The opportunities for anti-competitive behavior and deceptive practices are rampant. For the most part, it's operating as a tax on current products rather than as a mechanism for bringing forth new products, new innovation. And to me, that's the perspective that we should worry about the most. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and actually, it goes perfectly to, to Brad, who is a VC. <laughs> but you can tell me whether you disagree with that. <laughs> I'd love to, you know, to talk a little bit about that and, and what Robin said and your experience has been. But also, if you can um, hit on this, there is this perception, I think, in the venture capital community um, that people feel like, VCs will only invest if you have a patent, or they're, mm. they're I know you guys, you know, Brad and your partners tend to be the exception to that, but but I think we have a problem in the community. So if you can talk about both those things. Okay. Um, so the problem with using us as an example is that we invest in a very specific and very narrow thing. We invest in um, essentially consumer-facing web services or networks, and those networks are all defined by software and 
So the only patents that any of our companies would be applying for, if they were to apply for patents, would be software. We don't do biotech. We don't do nanotech. We don't do material science. We don't do robotics. We don't do you know. We don't do any of that. So I think we have, as as, as a result, we we do not encourage our companies to apply for patents. We think that um, the the you know the patent life cycle or the life you know that the seven years that it would take to get approval. Um, in those seven years, the chances that you will have succeeded or failed are almost 100%. I mean, you will either have succeeded or failed before the patent issues. So the only thing that is, you know, applying for the patent does is give you some residual value if you fail, if you believe there is residual value. And unfortunately, the only way that there is residual value is if it trades to somebody who's going to do really unethical things with it. So now you have a problem with um, whether or not you want to go there. Um, so, um, you know, I feel, I feel like we don't need to, and as much as I'm tempted to, and as, um, as Mike said, I was in Washington last week talking to uh, senators mostly in, in, a, in a session that they set up, and, um, you know, it was, it was just so easy to get them to put their hands up and say, okay, I, I give up, I get it, I get it, I understand there's a problem, you know, but tell me what the solution is, right? Because mm -hmm. if you tell the, some of the stories that we told, like um, we have a, one company that uh, was doing 10 million in revenue, 70 people employed, um, and they were hit by two patent trolls in a row. And unfortunately, they, this is the, the entity question, they were not, these were contingency lawyers working with uh, actually defunct venture capital firms mm. and you know trying to recover some asset value in the defunct portfolio companies um, and Amazing. so and so there wasn't re but they weren't classic trolls in, in either case but in in both cases they were pro they were asserting a, a kind of ridiculous patent in one case it was a um, and that we see a lot of these patents um, does anybody remember the old cop shows when you used to do a composite sketch by sliding a piece of paper that had an eyes and a nose and a mouth, mm -hmm. right? Um, well, there's a company that claims to have invented that. Um, they didn't actually invent that because, of course, people have been doing that for a thousand years. They invented doing it on a computer. Mm -hmm. So, and they were able to assert a patent saying, we, anybody who does eyes and nose and mouth on a computer, well, the problem is that our little company was a marketing services company that was doing um, creative social media marketing campaigns for big brands. And, um, and so they would allow you to create your own avatar to represent you in these social media campaigns. Um, and so you could pick an eyes and a nose and a mouth to create your avatar, right? It's not, it, it, you know, it's not law enforcement. It's not sold to police departments. It was doing something that had absolutely nothing to do with the original company. But because of the way software patents are written, you could say, well, you're changing out eyes and nose and mouth on a computer. Right. We invented that. Um, and I would bet that that patent didn't say anything. It only said the process of changing things on a computer to, to bring a composite photo. In other words, nothing about how you would actually do that, mm. just the idea. Correct, correct. And, and, okay, and so it, it, it gets crazier. Um, they um, and to that point, um, I'm going to mix things up just to make it a little easier. They're, they were sued by a se second. The other thing that this company could do is they could allow you to put your face in an ad. So GM has a new car that comes out. They have a video, and, and you can put your face in the ad, driving the new car, and send it to all your friends. Okay. Well, there was a company that had a technique for um, back in Sesame Street days in VHS to, you could send something in and you could have your kid play with Barney on a video, right? So to put, okay. And so this was the second patent um, that, that we were sued by. Um, the, the thing that took the company out of business is that the, 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 the troll in this case sued um, not just our company, but they sued their customers. And so you had Cadillac and American Express going, what the fuck? This is an uncapped liability. You're telling me I might be on the hook for millions of dollars, and all I was doing was running a little marketing campaign? Uh, and so I'm out. I'm gone. And so they went from 10 million to 3 million in revenue in about a month, um, and uh, run rates. Um, and all the, all the pending business dried up, and they had to lay everybody off, and then they hung in for another 
six months, and then they went out of business. Um, and so, um, and in that second suit, um, the, the irony was, not only did they not say how they did it, right, <laughs> but they, um, they actually, in trying to negotiate a settlement with the company, which they actually, the company ultimately agreed with, but it was too late to save the company, um, they, uh, part of the settlement was, you give us the technology to do the thing that we claim to have invented. Because we were doing it, you know, we knew how to do it, and we were actually doing it with a very sophisticated 3D modeling technology that allowed for you to put an actual 3D representation of a face into a 3D video in a, in a much more sophisticated way than they had ever executed. So we invented all this technology to actually do it, um, and they couldn't do it, so we agreed to give them the technology to do the thing that they had invented. So those, are, those horror stories are too easy, right? And, and because there are just so many of them out there. Um, and, and all of the lawmakers kind of came back and said, I, I know it's a problem, tell us how to solve the problem, which is why I think we have to address Mike's problem. Because a lot of them came back and said, we're hearing that if we, if we make these fixes, that independent inventors will be hurt. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I have to say that I don't have any evidence that any independent inventors are actually prosecuting business and, and business method and software patents um, or, or asserting them. Um, but I'm sure that, that they are. Um, but I also, you know, the tricky part for me is that, that you know, a lot of these patents were, were issued, you know, in the early days when software patents first were allowed, um, when the patent office had no idea what to do with it. And so they assumed, well, if you do it on a computer, it's novel, mm -hmm. right? And they, they, they granted a patent that which should never have been granted. Um, one of the solutions is something called covered business method patent review, uh, which is what Chuck Schumer is proposing. And you know what that would do is allow um, a person who is sued by one of these patents to, to say, I would before we, we pursue this suit, let's just confirm that it's a good patent. Um, and that would put it back into a review, pro an accelerated review process at the patent office. And you know the question is, you know, would that separate good patents from bad patents? Uh, now that we have 15 years of experience of bad patents being asserted, and we can see that how obvious that is, would we do a better job of recognizing that problem? And would we? Well, it turns out that that almost everybody who is in the business of asserting patents hates that idea because it turns out that 80 percent of the business method patents that are uh, reviewed are found invalid. Um, and so if I'm in the business of asserting patents, I don't want that. But if I'm actually a real inventor with a real patent, and I'm confident that I actually invented something, I shouldn't be afraid of that. But we're actually doing that right now ourselves. You're doing a CBM? It, well, I don't know the technical yeah. name for it, yeah. but we're actually putting it through a second review ourselves. Yeah, EFF has done a bunch of those, too. Um, you're paying now. for a second review? You're doing what? No, we're, um, we, we found some prior art that intersected with ours. And so we, we need to acknowledge that. So we're re requesting an accelerated review in order to narrow our own claims regarding the patent. Mm -hmm. So it used to be more common that people would put their own patents back into review um, because it actually makes your patent stronger when it comes out. Mm -hmm. um, I hear that less now because I think people feel like they have these runaway patents, much like you talk about. Um, but of course, the Supreme Court is taking up some of these questions this term. And I'm cautiously optimistic that the court, the court, um, Congress is only so politically brave. They will only do so much. I think the court um, very well may go farther. I'm hopeful um, the court may go farther. Um, we could do. You end up with this kind of patent review. Can the patent office handle this? If you, yeah. If you, how many more patents would then be? If you go, if you put all software. Well, it's kind of self-funding. It's kind of self-funding because it's not. It's much cheaper than litigation to do this type of review. Yeah, I'm talking about the patent cheap. office stuff. So the White House this morning announced that um, it, would like to, it would like to have um, all fees from the PTO captured and held within the PTO, which would be, which would be an addition of $400 million. Um, that should... It would like to. It would like to. I mean, I, I obviously yeah. I read it. I listened to it as so I'm yeah. coming in here, well, so I can't tell you It would like to, and actually that's what ought to happen if the PTO is a fee-funded agency that sets out the appropriations process, but... 
that isn't what happens in the normal course. Well, but the, the patent office has been in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. the AIA, the American Events Act, actually, the only sticking point when the House and the Senate came to reconcile the two bills, which was, I think, three, two, three years ago now, um, was this capturing funding. Um, but it was right at the height of the debt ceiling arguments, mm -hmm. um, it, which, you know, totally unrelated to patents, but that's what kind of won the day. Um, but there are some more bills pending, and the White House supports them to keep <coughs> the funds in. The Patent Office is one of the only government agencies that's in the black. It actually makes a ton of money. It's just a matter of it. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's two questions. One, do they have the money? So that is, in the in the political game, as I understand it, that's an important first step towards moving towards it, and, and hopefully mm -hmm. that is where it will go. I don't want to say that's where it will end up, but but I think that's a good, the announcement this morning is a critical piece. The second question is, do they have the capacity, even if they have the money? Sure. That's a trickier question. There are questions about how um, effective the PTO is, how captured it is by the patent industry, right. the patent making industry itself and the incentive structures within That's it. So there are issues. Problem. Yeah, they, then those, will, then those, are, those are continuing concerns. I think one other quick thing I'd like to comment that both of you said, something that, that both kind of talked about this definition of entities problem, and I think some opponents of reform in D.C. have been like, oh, you can't define a troll, so we can't do this. And I think that's total BS. Um, I don't think you need to define a troll. I think the important thing for these conversations is that you define certain crappy behavior. And the kind of legislative proposals we're seeing that we are optimistic about, and after Paul talks to Mike, we'll also talk about those a little bit, um, they get at certain behaviors, not certain mm -hmm. people. And I think that's a very important distinction. And saying that you can't define a troll for purposes of holding up reform is a dangerous sideshow. Because we don't need to define a troll to define what is and what isn't appropriate. And those sideshows, and I'll talk a little more about this, those sideshows are popping up left and right yes. right now. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to turn to Paul. And I'm hoping you can give a little bit you know, perspective from inside a company. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Brad has had some of this experience maybe as a board member um, and an advisor to a lot of these companies. I've had the experience kind of day to day of dealing with it. So I'm the, um, uh, you know, in-house in counsel for a company. We're about 200 people, 250 people right now. When I started, we were about half that. Um, and I think we're, you know, that actually puts us well ahead of the game in terms of all the other startups out there who don't have any lawyers. They may have outside counsel, but any time you talk to them, you know, of course, the, the meter is running. Um, so it was my job. We, we haven't had a lot of patent troll suits, fortunately, but we've had a few. And you really get to see just from, uh, you know, the, the few that we have had, the tactics, and, and really, you know, how the trolls are actually leveraging the system to get what they want, and then how it impacts us as a company and especially as, you know, engineers and people that should be doing things other than depositions um, and me who should be doing other things than dealing with patent trolls. Um, kind of to start off with, I mean, the, as you were saying, you know, the kind of complaints that you get, the actual form of the demand or the form of the complaint. We, with one of our lawsuits, I mean, we there wasn't preceded by any demand letter, we just got the complaint and it was a copy of the patent four screenshots of our website, and that was it. It was like seven pages, four pages long, and then they copied the patent. And then soon after that, there was a letter saying, you may have seen our lawsuit, you know, you can make this go away for, you know, I think it was four and a half million or something oh my like gosh. that. Yeah. Um, so please, you know, let's, let's start this, this settlement dialogue. And I mean, that number isn't just pulled out of thin air. I mean, that closely correlates to the number that it would cost us to hire our own outside counsel and go through the whole process and, um, you know, if the, and, 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 and win, actually. You know, if we were to win and to invalidate the patent, that's the, the, the price of admission, the price to, to kind of play that game. So really, you know, from our standpoint, from my standpoint, was a couple of things. It was, number one, minimize the cost, which means, um, small, you know, check that we're writing to outside counsel and or the patent troll. I mean, I don't really see those two amounts as really all that different, frankly. It's money out of the company for making this go away, honestly. Yeah. Like, it really didn't, you know, the, the, that was sort of the top line. Well, one's much quicker than the other. Exactly, and I think, but that plays into the second cost, which is... One makes that question. Uh, possibly. I mean, and that's sort of the thing, you know, strategically that definitely is a consideration. And I think the other piece of the cost, which is maybe 
just as important, if not more so, is just the cost to us as a business of the distraction. Um, and you know, having only one lawyer and you know a bunch of inventors really that you know develop the technology that is at issue, trying to um, shield them really from something that I just viewed as a complete waste of time. I don't think a lot of people understand. I remember being shocked when I learned how much time it can take of engineer time if yeah. you do engage in that process and what discovery means. So can you just yeah, yeah, no, and that's and that's that's a really good point because I think that's the thing I, I, I you know I was I was very focused on is and, and and the trolls are as well because cost of litigation when you talk about it is 80, 90 percent discovery, and that's the troll's weapon, frankly. I mean, it's the it's the cost you have to pay to lawyers to go through the discovery process and the cost in terms of time of your people, and so. Um, they, it's in their interest to make that as painful for you as possible. I think a normal case where there's something actually at issue and there's discovery kind of equally on both sides, the parties will sort of, you know, there's sort of a detente there. They're like, hey, we're not going to make this, you know, terribly painful for the other party because they can just do the same to us. And as you were saying at the beginning, I mean, it's completely asymmetrical in the control lawsuit. So they had a list of 40 people they wanted to depose on our side, and there's no one to depose on the troll. So there's one guy um, who's the inventor of the patent. Um, so, I mean, you know, we would get, probably in the heat of it, we would get, I would say, about five to seven letters a day demanding different things, scheduling depositions. If you don't write back to them the next day, you get five more letters. And this would go on, and their intention is really just to harass, to intimidate, and to drive up your costs. Because I would have to send each one of those letters to our lawyer to read them and to write back. And that just, you know, if they can, they can drive up that cost and they can front load it on you as much as possible in the process. That's their leverage. And so I'm sorry, I'm laughing because I know of one of one lawyer who sent back an email that said perhaps you should find a pen pal abroad. <laughs> yeah. And I'm laughing because I have PTSD from being an associate. That <laughs> litigation associate's very hard. And I, you know, and I think you know, I've seen, it's interesting because we had a very specific way of kind of going about this. But you know, we were in these defense groups. One of the things we tried to do was kind of join with all the other companies that are being sued and kind of consolidate under a single counsel. Um, it's a very it's a very difficult thing to do just because it turns sort of into a prisoner's dilemma where some of the companies are much smaller and they have a different incentive to try to get out of the case early and then from my standpoint you know especially when it's your first couple of patent cases you're saying to yourself well you know it might be cheaper to settle this now but I don't want this to be on the record showing that you know you could send a complaint in to, to, to us you know in the first you know, for, you know, and a month later you get a check back. You know, it's like an ATM. I don't, I definitely don't want that. So, I mean, that's sort of the interesting question, you know, I'd have for you is just sort of seeing this as a little more broader scale. Is what do you, I mean, what do you tell, what do you tell companies to do if you say, is it worth it to fight these things? Is it worth it to not? Um, and do you and your partners, on the converse, the, the sort of counterfactual of the innovation is helped by patent trolls argument. Yeah. You go to these prospective companies that are coming and pitching you and saying, you know, we'd love to invest, but we think a patent troll is going to come after you here, here, and here. And we've seen that with nine other companies, so we're going to we need to ease back. Do you see that? I mean, is, it's the chilling effect question at a certain point. Um, so the answer to the first question is um, we, we don't really tell them one way or the other. Um, I mean... First of all, we're minority investors. We don't control the companies. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, um, founders have different personalities. Um, we just had, it's going to seem completely unrelated, but a another form of extortion that's popping up these days is DDoS attacks. Mm -hmm. um, and they're sending letters, and it's exactly the same phenomenon. I can front load the cost to you. I can let you out for X. Um, but then you're, you know, then you're creating that ATM machine the minute somebody sees that, they, you know, that that's a real problem. And so we've had one company who was hit with a DDoS attack and was offered an out for four hundred and fifty dollars. Hmm. And they said no. And they've just agreed to refund everybody in, that was hurt by this. Uh, it'll cost them two hundred and fifty thousand oh. dollars to uh, to to refund everybody. Um, but they said, no, I'm not going to pay $450 to this extortionist. Yeah. So that's a personality thing. We have another company, um, actually this company that actually ultimately went out of business, um, was run by 
very pragmatic people who were just trying to get out, uh, and they were constantly negotiating, and they just couldn't negotiate fast enough um, to, to come okay. up with a deal to get yeah. out. Um, yeah. And so it, I, we don't tell them which way. And then the second question was, do you advise when you're oh, trying to pick your companies? No, because there's not, because having had the experience of being sued by somebody who was in criminal justice selling enterprise software when I was doing mm -hmm. marketing services for consumers, where do you start to look? You know, you couldn't you couldn't possibly yeah. cover the landscape and say, oh, that's not going to work. So we just pay no attention. There's an interesting paper um, by Tim Lee and Christina Mulligan from Yale. They talk about scaling the patent system, and mm -hmm. I. I think they put out the paper a little bit too early in this larger debate, which is unfortunate, because I think it's a very helpful conversation. And the idea is that so many of these patents are so hard to understand, so crappy, just say on the computer or on the internet. But we're literally talking about tens of, if not hundreds of thousands, that even if you could read them and try and get some idea to assess your risk, you actually couldn't because of the sheer number. Right. Um, it's not a bad one. Can I answer your chilling effect one? Because yeah. there is some data for that. Mm -hmm. So when you when you do surveys, you really get a hundred percent answer. I got a hundred percent answer on chilling effect. Um, the the question of the VCs was if you were thinking of investing in a company and it had a patent suit against that, would that be a deterrent to you? And half said it would be a deterrent on its face, and half said it could be a deterrent. They'd have to look further. It, you just don't well, usually that, get that's a situation like that. where there's a known there's exactly a known right. right. exactly yeah. Yeah. In, in the known case, unknown is not the unknown. yeah that's different from right. yours. But right. in terms of the if yeah. you got one on there, that's yeah. and of course the trolls know the right moments to mm -hmm. appear right before sure. around funding before you go public some, yeah. you know, some moment where you are vulnerable to so to be fair I have looked into that and I can't find I mean I can find I can find individual ones where that's happened but not systemic oh, so, really? so they don't seem to have picked that up as the core of what they're doing yet at least that's you know, don't give them any ideas but there are some I was going to say Julie so this is the first time we've ever given a patent troll too much credit <laughs> well you know I think that was more yeah. I mean, anecdotally we, we yeah. get hit at those moments right. yes and that's what uh, I expect between I the time an acquisition is announced and closes mm -hmm. uh, between the time that uh, a um, you know a new funding round is is in the works so we I, get I, hit those moments. Right so I looked at the um, within a year of when you got your funding and so we looked at that first you said, did you get something right there and there are only 11 percent who had yeah, the problem is you if you, you, you know you need to look at the difference between funding between series B and series C because if you look at series A they're too small oh. to even be known Right, so all, you know, I said 25 of our 55 companies have been sued. The ones that haven't been sued have four people and a dog. That's interesting. Uh, <laughs> and they've raised a million dollars, and they, you know, they're not just, they're not on anybody's radar. And I'll say, so, the, yeah. let me just answer that. More of the, the ones that I had were sued with four, in the four people and a dog stage, mm -hmm. free funding. In other words, they're just not, the, the trolls don't seem to be looking that hard. Well, we um, get those too. We get these, we get these, the, the, the mass mailings um, yeah. where, you know, we had, we had one company that was sued as a consumer of a, uh, of a processor that uh, one of the Acacia was, was mm. going yeah. after. Um, and, you know, we literally had no sales at that point. No sales. So the, if you, the damages would be zero, right? But, but we got the letter and we had to spend $25,000, you know, dealing with the letter. Mm -hmm. I don't mean it's just not there. I just mean it's not a systemic pattern yet that they. What about, and it's the same. Um, it's a much smaller sample set, obviously, but companies going public. Yeah. So I've just looked at all the companies that that I've reached out to. All the companies had an IPO in the last um, five years, and of the ones that I've gone back again, you can find it anecdotally, but it's not it's not widespread. Every time I look at this data, I worry about publishing it because I worry this is going to give yeah, me a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so we have 15 minutes left. I want Mike to give a quick overview of um, kind of where we are. So if you can try and keep it to like about five minutes, because yeah. I do want to have this conversation. Um, well, and I, I, I think part of this conversation has focused on where we've been in terms of building a patent system. That we've moved from commoditization to weaponization. What we're trying to do is forestall getting to where Skynet is self-aware with the patent system a little bit, um, and we need to find detente and disarmament in the patent system. That's where the politics of this comes in. Um, as I said in the open, the House has passed um, mostly a litigation reform bill. The Senate will take up in the course of the next month or so um, a very similar package. And these are things like fee shifting, uh, bonding has been discussed, uh, caps on discovery, lots of um, legal behavior that uh, the trolls are using. 
This is an attempt to try to, again, forestall that behavior. There's also one other piece that was not involved in the House side bill, which is demand letter. Um, uh, Again, it's in a little bit. A little bit. But this is a much broader, this is a much broader attack. There was a jurisdictional issue in the House, so now we have the opportunity to do this in two committees in the Senate, and I think we can have a, a little bit broader package here, which will help. None of this is a silver bullet. As Julie talks about, um, there's uh, issues uh, before the Supreme Court, a couple of, one or two cases? Four. Four. Four cases before the Supreme Court that are um, th that may in fact go further depending on how the court rules, which your guess is as good as anybody's. Um, but from a political standpoint, this is a solid attempt by members of Congress who very rarely understand an issue as technical and wonky as this one um, to try to get at the root of the problem. But it's not a silver bullet. The CBM program is something that, um, and patent, attacking patent quality generally, and um, supporting PTO and making sure they have the adequate funding to get good patents moving into the system um, are things that we're, we're going to have to um, move on as well. It may happen in this process. We may have to do it as step two or step three and beyond, depending on how some of the, the, the inner workings and the deal shake out in the cloakroom mainly. Um, but we're at a point now where there's general consensus, as, as Brad noted, uh, among senators that there is a problem, we need to do something to fix it. But the voices that are more prevalent in that community, in, in, in Congress right now, are the small inventors, the universities, people that um, are either propped up by the trolls themselves or are making money through licensing deals that don't want to see that being harmed. And they're dangling the idea of the tinkerer in his garage making a widget who is now not going to be able to defend his patent. There is nothing in either the House or the Senate package that would move forward that would, that would stop a, a, a small inventor from being able to assert their patent. All we're asking people to do is to be able to speak um, more uh, technically about the patent they own, where it is exactly being infringed and why, and then to move into that process. Overall, it is a deterrent to a scurrilous business practice that needs to be stopped because it's costing $29 billion in 2011, and I can tell you that number went up over the last couple of years. Um, these are all meant to disarm, deter this kind of practice. Patent trolling is great work if you can stomach it, right? Because it's a letter and then you get a $25,000 check. We need to figure out the political way of making that less attractive to, to bad actors who are in a system taking advantage of loophole. These are ways to do it. But our community needs to be more involved. We've sent Brad to Washington. I keep going there with Paul. We're going to send people back to, to try to um, keep the drumbeat going. But the fact of the matter is Qualcomm and, and the patent trolls and the universities, they have K Street lobbyists. And they're there, they're at the cocktail parties, they're at the fundraisers, they're at the kids' softball games, they're you know, taking staffers out on a Wednesday night. People in our community, we're building things, we're building products, and so it's a little harder for us to get away, but over the next couple of months, we're gonna have to, because if we do, it's the first step to stopping this, and I think we're getting there. Yeah, and oh, yeah. actually, Brad, oh, yeah. Sorry, can no. I give a different perspective? I, and I appreciate that perspective very much, because just even in my own company, we were, uh, building an email replacement system and there was a little feature that I saw on Google that I thought, oh, this would be really cool to put in our, in our system. Then I suddenly said, oh my gosh, you know, um, if we include this feature, then we can get sued by Google. And, but then in the process of finding out what are fair and reasonable licensing fees, I found out that typically two to five percent of the value that particular invention adds to the, uh, uh, to what the overall system is. And, and I said, well, that would be t totally fair because you know if this um, this portion of the invention was accounting for say one percent of the entire the entire um, thing that we're doing, and you take two to five percent of the revenue of that, I said, well, that would be fair. Um, the problem from the from the inventor standpoint is this: if you have an in invention, and we've avoided going through the the intermediaries right now, the the NPUs, the trolls, exactly because it's just such a in, in, in Steve Jobs' word, it's it's thermonuclear war, you know. And and who wants to get involved with that when your main concern is you, you're an innovator, you want to invent. But from the inventor standpoint, there's a, a there's a huge problem that's that's not talked about here. And and what that is, 
is if you don't have some intermediary to act for you, and you go to a company who is legitimately using software that you've developed or, or an idea that you've developed, then there's something called a declaratory judgment. And you probably can explain that better than I do. But basically the idea is just by even approaching them, you can be slapped with a declaratory judgment, and you, the inventor, lands up being put into court. And also not having a, a, a legal group or a law firm representing you, suddenly you're in the same position you're all saying, that you're in, which is totally legitimate. I understand that viewpoint. But from the opposite side of the, 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 the fence, um, the inventor is in that same position. So the only alternative, then, is to go through the MPE. Because um, you, know, you put years of your life, you, if you have a venture capitalist who's funding you, then you have, uh, you've gotten back uh, financially. But perhaps you've put your own home on the line. Perhaps you've put your whole life's fortune into into developing a piece of software. And then suddenly you find that other people are using it and you don't want to stop them, but you want to be able to collect at least something for the years of work that you've put into something that you're now, you've sort of been moved away out of the market from being able to, to capitalize on. So the, the question is, what's the fair thing to do? And so I think the answer to that is, you know, you're, you're taught that a problem and for small inventors and they're, they're, they're in a tough spot. And so what I, I would say is the analogy is I'm in a tough spot, but I don't want to go to a loan shark because that's not going to make life yeah. better for me or for society. I think answering your earlier question, which is now that we agree there's a problem, how do we fix it? I think the focus has to be on products, on whether we, on, on incentives, on business models, on legal recognition of those who are making products. I think that is just a founding principle for you know, all of these different initiatives. We could start from that. I think we'd, we'd go a long way. I'm but, really but, but you don't. You're not answering Mike's, Mike's yes. question yeah. because he's saying he's making a product, um, and he can't afford to defend the product. Right. So, so I'm so saying. I, 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 so here's what I would say. If you have, media. yeah. So so what I would like to see is the development of intermediaries related to the development of products. What you have now are intermediaries related to skimming off the top. Yeah. So if the patent system is focused on, are there products coming out of this, disadvantaging those who are not making products? Those intermediaries go away, and you get new intermediaries that can solve your problem. And, and I agree with that, and I, I absolutely believe that. I mean, for the last year, I've sort of been <laughs> building a brain trust of people around me to help solve this problem um, for us a, a, as a company. Coming from the opposite perspective, but from the same perspective, in that we're, we're developing software and understanding that, that there are so many abuses in the industry. Um, but you're also getting at the very basis of why the US patent system was, was founded the way it was founded. You had the British system prior to the 1600s or 1700s that was based primarily in it being a, um, a product-driven company that actually filed for patents. And when the US system got put into place, it was put into place uh, specifically to allow the smaller people who didn't necessarily have the ability to bring their product to market to nevertheless protect themselves on the ideas that they had and then go to a company and say, hey, this is the idea that we have, and um, you know, how can we work with you in some way, shape, or form? It was like me when I was a kid, 19, 20 years old, going off to Hollywood, getting interviewed by these studios. I had no protection, and I got taken advantage of exactly in that scenario. Likewise, as an inventor, how do you prevent your you know, going to a company who can find very valid use of your invention. So, so I, I, I want to draw yeah. into something here because this, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, um, I want to understand, I, I want to challenge the, the whole notion that we should be patenting software. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Right? <laughs> okay. and, and, and so um, the other argument that, that, that you often hear is that the reason for um, for a patent is that, that there's an enormous amount of time and, and cost associated with creating something new and that if it can just be ripped off tomorrow, then nobody's going to invest that time and, and energy to do it. Um, software has this really weird characteristic where, uh, you know, it's, it doesn't have, it's not, it's not a pharmaceutical, it's not going through 10 years of, of drug trials, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's really the embodiment of an idea, right? And the question is, and it's, it's in a funny way, it's a little bit related to how you were ripped off in Hollywood. You know, it's, you, you came to Hollywood with ideas and they weren't protected. And you're coming to the software world with ideas and you're trying to figure out how, how to protect those. And 
I just wonder if, if we should, as a society, be protecting those. Well, um, actually, you said something wonderful in the seminar yesterday. You boiled down the whole ID management issue to one single word, which is trust. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's kind of like, um, what, what was the famous saying with my Roosevelt? Uh, trust and verify or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> that was so Reagan. 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, okay. was okay. um, Trust but verify. Okay. Okay. Or, okay, okay, maybe I'm thinking of the big stick. Thing. Whatever. Um, but there's got to be some intermediary thing because the truth of the matter is, is that there, there are plenty of companies who will take advantage of a, a smaller company or a smaller inventor. When I first got involved with tech, there was somebody who I wanted to get involved with, and so I started to tell him about the, the, the software that we were producing, and he wasn't satisfied that I was, um, he, he wanted me to disclose the whole nine yards to him. So his, he said to me, he says, well, what's to stop me from just taking what you told me already and, and, and producing right. it myself? And I said, well, a little thing called patent that I filed, and so that, Saved me in that particular instance. But couldn't you have also used a non-disclosure yeah. agreement? I, I also had a non-disclosure agreement. I did have a non-disclosure agreement with him, but non-disclosure agreements are also very nebulous things. But because either way, you've got to go to court. So even to get somebody to sign a non-disclosure agreement, you have to disclose <laughs> what you're going to disclose to them, or at least give some sense of it. So it's it, it is a very tricky thing for a um, for somebody who's inventing something for, from being able to talk about it and yet not have it. Being so in, in the examples that of our companies that are being sued, we would have been completely protected if there was something called an independent inventor's defense. So in no case did anybody ever disclose anything to any one of our companies. And this is all, you know, all 25, or actually it's more like 45 suits of 25 mm -hmm. companies. In no case was there any contact between the company and the, and the person suing beforehand. In no case was there any exchange of information beforehand, right? These are all out of the blue. Yeah. So, so you know, if, you know, and so what's happening here is that, you know, there's, you know, there's a certain need that emerges in the market. Five, six people realize, okay, we've got to solve this problem. They come up with different ways of solving the problem. And, um, and you know, one of them, has applied for a patent and, and and basically argues that all the others should not have should not be able to do it, right? So there's, but if if you had an independent invention defense, you'd say, well, you know, we had no contact, we had no awareness. This was not published at the time we invented or we created, um, so we should we shouldn't be prescribed from doing it, right? Um, but well, that's we, a tricky problem. Yeah, we, we, we don't get there. Unfortunately, yeah. I think you know one thing that that. I think is important to just for a little bit of color here because especially this has an international angle. We have a one size fits all system in America and it's largely because of international agreements, one in particular called TRIPS, a whole much longer conversation mm -hmm. for another day. But I I personally believe that one of the biggest problems with our system is that one size fits all doesn't make sense. The way yeah. pharmaceuticals deal with patents should not be how software deals with patents. Something very simple to think of like, you know, a 20 year patent on a piece of software is insane. They're just um, ontologically different beings. Yeah, so. Right. Unfortunately, you know, that, that's kind of the way things are, but I think that's a really big problem. We have about really no time left. Um, Can I just add, just as the know. academic in the room, the narrative you gave about the patent history and its logic, there are problems in that narrative. It's, it's not 100% accurate, just to give you a heads up on that. Your declaratory judgment description, dead on. <laughs> um, but the history of the patent system doesn't quite go like that. It's, maybe you can clarify this, too. Yeah. But from the company side. Oh, can, can we like have other voices? Yeah, I sure, sorry. I've said way too much, and you're absolutely right. Please, do, do you have I, I mean, I have points. I don't want to say just for me, if other people have points. No, but we, I want to hear, I do. I think you have a very interesting perspective that hasn't really been um, discussed in this room. Uh, yeah, well, just to say a couple things. I, I was very interested that you were mentioning that the tech industry is largely absent from these debates. I work mainly in the international realm, like on trade agreements and at WIPO. And, um, you know, I always see the pharma, you know, glitzy wine and dine party, and then there's like the MPA A1. Um, but nobody, none of these negotiators are hearing about. Um, about the perspective from sort of new tech, right? Intel and IBM and Microsoft are there. Mm. Um, and in large part, it's because of these agreements that the US system ends up being reified. So like, there's a lot of things we can't go back on and test to think like, oh, maybe we should try and do things a little bit differently because that means like deconstructing uh, the system that's now been glo made global through the World Trade Organization. Um, and so I would be interested to see 
more uh, more interaction with tech as an industry um, because like access to medicines we're totally losing out right like pharma has like locked down on that um, and so so the implications go both ways it, you know and like when debates are going on and um, South Africa, which I imagine one day would probably be an important market for you folks. South Africa doesn't even have an examination system. If you file uh, the paperwork, they just give you a stamp and you have a patent, right? So um, there are like orders of magnitude more patents on everything in South Africa. And I imagine as the legal system develops there, you're going to have a much bigger problem there. And I would imagine you want to see like the major market of Africa um, and the trendsetter for Africa having a much better system. So engagement from tech there, what the engagement right now is mainly from pharma in the negative sense of trying to kill the reforms. Um, and so I think that there could, uh, tech and access to medicines people could be better allies. It's just that we don't understand each other very well and we don't interact a lot. And um, I'd like to see more interaction. Well, I wonder if there's some sort of connection there to Julie's point as well about, you know, we should treat software patents differently. The, the South African system is obviously only 20 years old. I mean, it's kind of much longer backlog, but the system is in place 20 years old. Maybe there's an opportunity to strengthen the needs where you need them and to make sure that it, we could create, help create a system there. I'm, I'm volunteering to go to South Africa because I used to live there in the country, but, um, but I think there's a way to, to possibly use it as a, as a system in transition, a system that's being built to yeah. you know, not take up the entirety of the New Zealand example of like, oh, software patents, not anymore, next. Yeah. Well, but um, Europe also is much, yeah. is much more uncomfortable with software patents and they don't really have it. Well,